Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, it's a feature story edition of our show. We'll look back again at the 25th Farm Aid concert held by Willie Nelson and friends. In Southern Gardening, we'll have a daily lead day school to tell you what you need to know to be successful growing these beautiful plants. Our first story today, though, will be about a logging crew that's small, but that hasn't kept them from being noticed. Owen Brothers Logging of Wiggins, Mississippi is known for treating the land right, and they were the 2009 Mississippi Loggers of the Year. We went to work with Glenn, and, you know, he didn't want a, a, a high production operation, and coming up, my family, my dad, you know, he was always working, never had time to come see a ball game. And so, you know, I didn't want to be like that for my family. Good day everyone, I'm, a I'm Amy Taylor. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Today it's a feature edition of our show. Amy, our first story this week is about a South Mississippi logging crew where bigger wasn't better. Owen Brothers of Wiggins have only one three-man crew in the woods and the emphasis is on safety and doing a quality job for the landowner, not high production. It's turned out to be a perfect prescription for the present economy we're in. It was also good enough to be named Mississippi Forestry Association's Outstanding Logger of the Year in 2009. Our Farm Week flashback takes us to northern Hancock County, less than 30 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. Farm Week's Leighton Span reports. Like many loggers, Terry Owen on the right and Jim Ed Owen on the left learn their craft from their dad, Walt Owen, who is standing in the center between them. Terry and Jim Ed left their dad and uncle's company and formed their own logging operation in May 1998. From the beginning, the brothers shared a different philosophy than their dad about logging. It was about having a life outside of the woods. The Owen brothers started small and have remained small on purpose. A local timber buyer they have worked with from the beginning also saw a good reason to cut fewer trees and have a shorter work day. Well, we came from a, a high production operation, Owen Logging. I run a crew. We were getting 12, 14 loads a day. My little brother run a crew, and they were doing basically the same thing. And we went to work with Glenn, and, you know, he didn't want a, a, a high production operation and coming up my family my dad you know he was always working never had time to come see a ball game and so you know I didn't want to be like that for my family. I saw where quality of work meant a whole lot of repeat business so we talked we discussed it we kicked it around and decided about six load a day three man crew is where you need to be and days when the mills are open longer hours or need more wood you can up it but uh, also in hard times and quotas and slow times, you can get by. So it's all about repeat business and the quality of work that brings the repeat business. In other words, lower production can result in a better job, which can in turn bring repeat business. Timber buyer Glenn Heron supplies the tracks of trees for the Owen Brothers crew to harvest. This job is located in the Nikes Lee Town area of northern Hancock County. The Owen brothers are doing a selective harvest, a more time-consuming process on a vast longleaf pine plantation. They are doing a stand improvement thinning while removing some of the trees that are suitable to use to make valuable poles. You can't do it fast. I had, I've got another logger that was uh, working on me right now and they got 19 loads yesterday. That logger would never work out up here. It's just too high production. This crew here, Terry Owen's crew, uh, they set their sights on about six loads a day, which is easy to keep up with as far as marking. Uh, they don't get in a hurry. I find him being so careful with the, with the place. I don't see any litter. It's just, uh, he's just done a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
uh, can go into some of the places where he's thinned and it's very clear that the stands have been really improved by his work. Uh, I marked the trees that uh, are selected to come out and Ronnie Meadows, the cutter man, you know, Hart, he'll cut the trees down. Jim Owen on the skitter, you know, slowly, uh, time, you know, take his time in, in getting the, the skidding trees out in a proper fashion without doing any residual damage to the, uh, the, the trees. And uh, of course, Terry on the lower does the, uh, the product separation. And we try to treat it like we own, I mean, if it was our property and we wanted to do it the way we'd want it done, so we try to protect the trees and, you know, not skin them. And, and uh, what, what really, Ronnie, our cutter man, that's where it all starts. And, and he's, he's been doing it a long time. And he, he, he lays the trees where we can, uh, where I can drag them without doing a lot of damage. And then my brother's on the loader and he merchandises out. And that's, I mean, we just try to make everything count and for the landowner and, you know, for, for Mr. Glenn and us too. Nowadays, most of your timber is sold per ton. And so the logger needs to merchandise and try to make the landowner every dollar he can. And, uh, you know, a lot of loggers is high production and they not, they don't take that time to really look at that small chip and saw tree. They might go ahead and put it in pulp wood uh, you know, or, or the small log and they put it in with chip and saw. Just little things like this and, you know, it would help the logger landowner relationship a little bit. In addition to seeing logger education improved in the area of merchandising, Terry Owen would like to see the general public have a greater appreciation for the value of wood and the fact that trees are a renewable resource. Owen Brothers Logging is known for respecting the land and promoting use of best management practices. The crew hosted a teacher's conservation workshop on a job site near Perkinston in recent years to explain their work inside a streamside management zone. Both Terry and Jim Ed Owen are fully trained in all modules of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and follow those principles on every job. You know, we know to stay back from runs, try to keep debris out, and, and we're trying to help Mother Nature. And, you know, as long as we do that and we keep replanting and, and we select cut, only clear cut when it's, it's needed. And, you know, that's the only thing I can say. Our future generations will still have trees. Uh, you know, they might be in debt from the government over the head, but they'll still have trees. Terry Owen does wonder who will be harvesting the trees in the future. He thinks there needs to be an organized effort to educate young people about a career as a logger and why it's important to the environment and our economy. Logging in the 60s and 70s, he was proud to be a part of that. And, uh, you know, you could find folks that wanted to work and, and enjoyed it. Now, uh, young people don't have interest in this type of work. They, they want to sit behind a computer or, or some kind of degree job. What the answer is, I don't know, but the way it's looking 10 years from now, there will be very few loggers. Nobody wants to get into it. I guess you have to have pine tar in your blood. So. Terry Owen is a passionate and articulate spokesman for the logging industry. He, along with his brother, Jim Ed, truck driver Tim Tanner, and cutter operator Ronnie Meadows are a great example of teamwork and professionalism. The, the care and the job that they do uh, is, is outstanding. Uh, and me being in the business as well, you can't say enough for a logger that, that, that takes care of each and every tract as if it was their own and has the objectives and goals in mind that a landowner would have and it's just a valuable, valuable asset to have in a logger. Their crew has been together for a long period of time. They, they work together really well. Uh, they don't do anything unless they can do it safely. Uh, they are uh, very, very good about what uh, uh, meeting the landowner's objectives. Uh, in fact, a lot of the state uh, tree farmers of the year have specified them to do logging work for them. 
Owen Brothers Logging makes a positive contribution to the forest industry in the state every day and has now for over 11 years. The crew also does its work in an extremely safe manner. There has not been one recorded lost time accident since Owen Brothers was formed in 1998. From Hancock County, Mississippi, I'm Layton Spann reporting. And if you're interested in watching this story again, you can go to our website, farmweek.msucares.com. You can also find us on YouTube. Using the search box, type in Farm Week as one word with quotation marks, and you'll find us. That's farmweek.msucares.com. Amy, Terry Owen asks a legitimate question. You know, we still use a lot of paper products uh, in our daily lives. Well, you got to have somebody cut that tree. I mean, we can have landowners grow trees. We can have companies that that uh, make products, but you got to have somebody in between to That's get that right. out. And it is a legitimate question uh, because it's a tough business to, to make a living in. Right, right. One of the things I might mention, a little sidebar of that story, an interesting fact, uh, Terry Owen is, as I said, from Wiggins. Well, he, uh, when he was young, had Dizzy Dean, who was a famous <laughs> baseball player that retired to Wiggins, used to play for the St. Louis Cardinals. Well, he was actually his coach when he was in Little League Baseball, so he had a brush with greatness there. I bet that was interesting. And in terms of Wiggins, he said it was. Old Diz was <laughs> quite a character. All right, so it's time now for today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. It's about the bragging rights for Mississippi's top agricultural commodity. What Mississippi commodity had the highest production value in 2010? This will be obvious to some, but not to others. Is the answer poultry? cotton, catfish, or soybeans? I'll have the answer after today's Southern Gardening segment. They're colorful, they're hardy, and they thrive in the South. So what's your excuse for not growing daylilies? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman has a daylily short course to get you started right. are one of those versatile and adaptable flowering perennials that require little care. Today I'm at Suburban Daylilies to share some easy to follow tips for daylily success. Typically daylilies would be purchased growing in one to two gallon nursery containers. Planting is as easy as removing from the container and gently loosening the root ball. Plant in a hole no deeper than the container. Daylilies should be planted in the full sun for best flowering. The flowers will be freshest in the morning. Be aware that many daylilies are between two and three feet tall and should be planted towards the back of the bed. The small and miniature selections in the 12 to 18 inch range are suitable for the front row. Even in the heat of our Mississippi summers, daylilies will continue to set flowers in bloom. While they're adaptable to most soil conditions, in Mississippi they should be planted in raised beds to enhance drainage. The soil should be slightly acidic and amended with good quality organic matter. While drought tolerant, consistent soil moisture will maintain superior flowering. As the flowers fade, seed heads will develop. These should be removed so more energy can be directed towards flowering. Daylilies are suitable for use as specimen plants, but I think mass planted daylilies are extra special. They're vigorous and fast growing and can form a dense mat in just a couple of years. Daylilies are not true lilies, but with their beautiful trumpet shaped flowers, they belong in every garden. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. It's time for the answer to today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. What was Mississippi's top agricultural commodity last year? It's a perennial number one, but a lot of people still don't know. The answer is A, poultry. Last year, Mississippi farmers grew two and a half billion dollars of chickens, broilers, and eggs. Mississippi forestry was a distant second at just more than one billion. We're going to pause now for a break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll have the calendar and one more feature story for you. The 25th Farm Aid Concert was held last fall. See how it and agriculture have changed since then. got a lot of choices to make in the coming years and I really want to make sure that I get it all right. I want to discover who I am, where I belong, what my dreams are. I want to find my hidden talents 
and see where those skills can take me in the future. I need leadership given today to help me make the right decisions tomorrow. And I have that with Mississippi 4-H. Before we get back to our last story, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Mississippi State University will hold two whitetail deer management short courses this summer. First will be Saturday, July 23rd. The cost is $95. Now that includes lunch, a t-shirt, and educational materials. You'll learn all about deer biology. You may find out some ideas that you have maybe don't quite exist in the real world. You'll find out about the factors that influence antler size and how different harvest methods affect it. You'll also find out how harvest methods maybe should differ for spikes and bucks. The first location is Northwest Mississippi Community College, that's at Senatobia. And then the registration will be limited at both sites to the first 70 people. We will have a link on the Farm Week calendar to help you register. The same workshop will take place the following weekend, Saturday, July 30th. That location is a College of Forest Resources building on the main campus of Mississippi State University in Starkville. Once again, registration is limited to 70 people at each site, so please register ahead of time. And go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events farther out in the future. Now check out this Farm Week snapshot. Our last feature story today is about an event that's not a novelty anymore. In fact, it celebrated its 25th annual show last year. It's hard to remember, but the Farm Aid concert caused a lot of stir when the first one was held in 1985. Concerts now move around the country supporting family farmers and getting consumers to buy into the local food movement. Market to Market's Laurel Bauer Bergmeier reports. 25 years ago, American farmers faced a crisis the likes of which hadn't been seen since the Great Depression. The good times of the 1970s had given way to low crop prices, falling land values, high interest rates, and mountains of debt in the 80s. For many farm families, the situation was dire. Well, I know I deserve some support because I have fed a world of people in 52 years. In 1985, Willie Nelson called on his friends in music to organize a groundbreaking concert called Farm Aid to help a struggling rural America. I had heard some rumors in Texas about some of the farmers and ranchers having a rough time, and I asked some of my friends around who were ranchers and farmers, and they said, well, it's, it's really bad in the Midwest. It hadn't really got that bad here yet, but it's on the way. So we started talking about what we might do, and call some attention to it and see if we could help the situation in some way. And so we did. Thank you all very much and welcome to Farm Aid, the concert for America. The first Farm Aid took place in Champaign, Illinois on a rainy day in September of 1985. Along with help from fellow founding members John Mellencamp and Neil Young, Nelson put the concert together in just a few weeks. All told, 54 acts appeared before a crowd of 78,000 people, making the first Farm Aid the largest combined country and rock concert in U.S. history. It sparked a movement that continues to this day, and from it came the Farm Aid Organization, which works year-round to help America's family farmers. Carolyn Mugar has been Farm Aid's executive director since the beginning. You know, I, don't, I don't think anybody could dip their foot into this without being, feel how fortunate they are to work with the people in the countryside that we work with. It's an extraordinary experience. Hello, wherever you are, whoever you are, thank you for joining us at Farm Aid tonight. Farm Aid celebrated its 25th anniversary in Milwaukee, Wisconsin last year. More than 35,000 fans filled Miller Park, home of the Brewers baseball team, on Saturday, October 2nd, to mark the historic event. When the walls come crumbling down.
While the music at Farm Aid is the main attraction, concert days offer much more. You folks here showed up on a cold day to help us support the family farmers. We showed up. This is what we need to be doing, and we need to keep doing it until somebody pays attention to us. And uh, they will eventually because we're not going anywhere. The day begins with the Farm Aid press conference. It's described by staff as part pep rally and part teach-in. Artists and farmers challenge the nation's leaders and all Americans to take action. In this big industrial farm era, if people are producing food for us with the sole goal of making money and as much money as they can and cut as many corners as they can, how can we assume as a society that they're going to produce the best food they can? Uh, as we sit here uh, today, uh, we're losing farmland and we're losing our rural farmers and we have to protect them and a lot of them are in the crowd here today. As the family farmer goes, goes America. What do we deserve? We deserve clean food. How can we get clean food? By looking for it. Wisconsin was chosen as the host state in part to draw attention to issues facing the dairy industry. For nearly two years, producers have been paid prices as little as half the cost of production. According to Farm Aid officials, family dairy farmers have lost upwards of $200 per month during the crisis on each cow they own, while the largest dairy processors have enjoyed record profits. 12,500 hundred cow dairies is fundamentally different than 255,000 cow dairies and you can't tell me otherwise. So we really need to work on this. Well, don't forget to put your email on those when you turn it in, then they draw your name out. Another key feature of Farm Aid is the homegrown village where concert goers can meet family farmers and learn about the roots of their food. Last year's homegrown village was bigger than ever featuring more than 40 interactive exhibits from Wisconsin and various farm, food, and environmental organizations. The last four years we've been having what's called homegrown concessions, and we've turned the food at the venue, at the place where we're having the concert, into food that is either locally grown, organically grown, humanely raised, any number of those um, qualifications, and that's um, what the food at these venues is. for the ham steak. Okay, we are the first um, local food vendor at Farm Aid, and so we'd like to think that we played, you know, some small role in, in Farm Aid moving toward this local food, you know, type of venue. And I think it's really important because lots of times we put, you know, local family farm food into a little box, and there are certain places you can get it. You know, you can get it at farmers markets, you can get it at local food grocery stores, and those are great, and we should support those efforts. But, you know, Farm Aid really took on a venue that really, I would say, nobody thought could be done and said, no, concert venues can be farmer-friendly, consumer-friendly, and, you know, you can hear some good music and you can eat some good, healthy food at a concert. And I think they're demonstrating that every year more and more. Find something good to Farmer working on the ground, yeah, homegrown's all right with me. More than two decades, the concerts have been held all across the country, from the heartland to the deep south, and from the west coast to the eastern shores. Likewise, Farm Aid's artists come from all over the musical map. Last year's lineup included Amos Lee, Band of Horses, Jamie Johnson, Jason Mraz, Lucas Nelson in The Promise of the Real, and Jeff Tweedy. The headliners were first-time Farm Aid performer Nora Jones, Kenny Chesney, Dave Matthews, Neil Young, John Mellencamp, and of course, Willie Nelson. You can leave me a tip if you can, but I'm a shooting shot. Every artist donates his or her performance and travel expenses to Farm Aid. Twenty-five years after making its inaugural benefit, Farm Aid officials say there is still much to be done. 
The organization has grown to a staff of nine along with its board of directors, including Nelson, Mellencamp, Young, and Matthews, who joined in 2001. I don't know, I'm about half stubborn, I guess, and when I start something, I don't like to quit it, and I'm glad to see the Farm Aid organization feels the same way. Those guys over there are tough, and they, they fight the fight every day, here and there, all over the farm industry with the big guys and the little guys, and it's important that we stay with it because it's, there's a lot of opposition to it from powerful people. If you are interested in watching the Farm Aid story again, you can go to our website, farmweek.msucares.com. We'll also have links to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well and read the script. That's farmweek.msucares.com. Amy, I'm not, I don't agree with Willie Nelson on all his opinions about U.S. agriculture, but I still have to think that anything, though, that can get people involved with this is how food is grown, I mean, our whole society is just disconnected. It's too easy to go to the store and buy the food and bring it home, you know. And so at least they get an appreciation, and I think uh, Farm Aid is, is bringing part of that uh, to the public, an appreciation of food. Right. We do have to raise, raise awareness for sure. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, you're going to meet a man who's a passionate farmer, and he operates a feedlot. And you may find it surprising, but his feedlot actually wins recognition for the environmentally friendly way he runs it. And in Southern Gardening, think daylilies don't have variety. We'll go to suburban daylilies to see the many colors and flower types available. For the rest of the Farmer crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Amy Taylor. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next week.